yes, indeed, I should mention that uh, I'm the founder of the Middle East and South Asia Quantum Computing Meetup Group. Uh, it's something I established uh, a year ago while I was in Abu Dhabi. And where I, while I was in Abu Dhabi, <laughs> I saw quite a bit of interest in the South Asian and Middle Eastern region, uh, you know, in, in uh, new technology, certainly AI. And uh, I was seeing the, the beginnings of interest in quantum computing. Uh, this is evident by the fact that Quant Abu Dhabi is, in fact, building its own quantum computer now. Um, it's, it's a great, uh, you know, great to see that happening. Uh, I think the MESA region has a lot of potential, uh, and that's evident by uh, our two speakers, panelists today here. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Yarjan and Dr. Shabazz, who Dave will introduce in more detail in just a bit, uh, you know, and... Uh, we, uh, I should mention that, you know, Dark Star Quantum Lab, uh, with, of which I'm one of the co-founders um, uh, and also acting as the interim CEO is a sponsor of this event. So um, I'll be talking a little bit about Dark Star near the end. And perhaps uh, we, you might hear more about Dark Star during the conversation. There's certainly more details at the end of my talk. Uh, Dave, uh, back to you to introduce our uh, esteemed uh, guest today. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Faisal. So I'm acting as, as the moderator. Uh, you may notice the Dark Star uh, emblem. Uh, I'm also a co-founder and the uh, chief operating officer as well as the chief uh, project officer. I had the pleasure uh, of, of meeting uh, Yarjan and, and Shabazz uh, yesterday. And we talked about cricket. We talked about bringing the world together through quantum technology. These two gentlemen have very impressive tech, and I'm hoping we're going to hear a little bit about that uh, as we get into this. But we'll start out with the with the business. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Vera. Uh, Vera is our media director for Dark Star, as well as for Mesa as well as for our other meetups. And again, thank you uh, for those who have joined us uh, today. It was short notice. We had the opportunity of, of creating this, this meetup and it's something that uh, I think will make the world a better place. Now, so this meetup is Cambridge Talks uh, with our PhDs, uh, Shabazz and, and Yarjan. Cambridge Talks, $62 billion CPEC project. So we'll find out what that means. Uh, and the need for quantum tech in Pakistan. Uh, I myself uh, am from Bombay, uh, India. And uh, our speakers uh, include Dr. Yarjan Abdul Samad, Senior Research Associate and Senior Teaching Fellow at University of Cambridge, United Kingdom. And Dr. Abdul Samad is a materials engineer turned materials scientist, working towards the development of new materials and devices for space, something that Dark Star is involved in, space and defense, advanced healthcare, sustainable environment and renewable energy applications. That's very exciting. And uh, your colleague, Dr. Mohammed Shabazz Anwar, research associate also at the University of Cambridge, United Kingdom. This is extraordinary from my experience. I'm excited to be here with two such esteemed PhDs from Cambridge. Dr. Anwar's research works are mostly on devices based for superconductivity and quantum materials, which have the potential to form the future of dissipation-less spintronics. I was so excited when you mentioned that word yesterday. Spintronics sounds really exciting. And quantum information technology. Dr. Anwar earned his PhD in Kamerling Ons lab at Leiden University, the Netherlands, and worked as a researcher GSPS fellow in quantum materials lab at Kyoto University, Japan. And our third speaker, is Dr. Fazl Shah Khan, co-founder and interim CEO, Dark Star Quantum Lab, uh, a dear friend of mine. Uh, Dr. Fazl and I have spent at least the last six months uh, on a daily basis, uh, all our evenings, uh, and we are still friends. Yes? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> 
and and uh, it is. I was so excited that Fassel found Yarjan and and Shanbaz for what you represent, and this meetup is in fact a pinnacle uh, for what it is that we represent at Dark Star. So we're very excited uh, to have you there. Now, Dr. Khan is the interim CEO of quantum tech startup Dark Star Quantum Lab, and his research work has produced peer-reviewed scientific papers that are motivating a scientific approach to the development of the product roadmap at Darkstar. Dr. Khan serves as an advisor also to Quantum Computing Inc., the first quantum startup to be listed on the stock market, which has approximately a $200 million market cap. And I am so excited that Dr. Faisal Shah Khan's work has also inspired, the work was based on his scientific papers for the IBM Q computer and for Microsoft Q sharp programming language. We have more to talk about later on at the end of, of, our, of our presentation uh, as to what other exciting quantum technology will come about. And we are again excited for, for Yarjan and for Shabazz to hear about their grand vision. In fact, uh, we start with a quantum of advantage is one of the themes here, a little bit of an advantage. And uh, Dr. Yarjan, you, I believe you have a published paper in a Pakistani newspaper about a vision for quantum computing. I'm gonna suggest we start uh, with, your, with your vision. And then we'll hear a little bit about uh, from Faisal as he connects it to, to CPEC, the $62 billion project, which he is involved in. And uh, Shabazz, we're going to hear uh, from, from you uh, and we're going to have a nice little conversation. Uh, as we talked about yesterday, we might throw in a little bit of cricket talk. Uh, Yarjan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dave, uh, for, for the very kind introduction and, and for all the kind words. Uh, so uh, referring to the article that I published in, in, in Pakistan about quantum computing and quantum information systems in Pakistan, so uh, I'm basically, you know, uh, talking about how can we proceed to, to infuse quantum information system and quantum computing in Pakistan, uh, primarily in the Pakistani universities and, and also, you know, like bringing startup companies to, to this direction. Um, so I point towards the nanotechnology, how it evolved in the 1960s and 70s. And, and you know, uh, a lot of countries basically uh, got the tag of developed countries because of the nanotechnology. And I, I, I was really, you know, impressed when I, when I read about so many countries which, which have uh, taken a lot of benefit from, from the nanotechnology because they were the first ones to, to jump into it and, uh, you know, uh, make the most out of the technology, be some of the leaders in the technology and not just the users. Uh, so now the quantum technology is in the same stage as the nanotechnology was in May, perhaps 80s. Uh, now is the time to, to not only do research because the times have changed and things have become much faster. Uh, what's, not, what, what's in the research labs today, we can see it you know, uh, uh, in commercial applications within a few years. So in, in this uh, perspective, what I've uh, tried to convey uh, to, to the uh, government of Pakistan or, or the authorities or even organizations or universities in Pakistan, I've tried to draw their at attention to quantum technology. Uh, I've tried to inspire them that there is a lot that the world is doing, uh, for example, the quantum flagship project uh, in, in the EU and um, yesterday we were talking about the, the half a trillion, uh, potential half a trillion dollar of uh, quantum computing uh, investment from, from the US, which I think uh, Dr. Pesel will talk more about. Uh, so these are the things that, you know, which, which, which tell us the importance of, of quantum information system for the future of technologies. Uh, one more point that you know I, I wanted to uh, clarify in my article is that many people 
confuse quantum technology uh, as a com as a competition to AI or machine learning. And in my view, it is not at all a competition to to anything actually, uh, let alone AI and machine learning, which are which are very uh, interesting fields of uh, engineering and sciences, which have to go in parallel with quantum technology rather. Uh, I would, I, I believe that quantum technology may lay the foundations on which uh, AI and machine learning can can prosper even further than 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 they can without quantum technology. So that's something that I've I've tried to draw attention, uh, you know, of, of Pakistani people in general, uh, you know, towards quantum computing and and quantum information system. And also there are, for example, many developing countries such as Bangladesh and India, they are trying to, to jump into quantum technology by not just uh, you, you know, becoming users, but, but by, uh, by uh, uh, kind of supporting their researchers and their leading scientists to go abroad and learn from, from the best in the world. For example, there are some professors from, from these countries in, in Cambridge who are, who are collaborating here and working alongside leading scientists who are building the, the next generation of quantum, quantum technologies. So this is something that I would like to see in Pakistan. And that's why I've, I've written this article to, to draw the attention of, 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 of people in Pakistan, especially the authorities. Yarjan, that was uh, that, that was that was lovely. Uh, you're a leader uh, between Cambridge and Pakistan, and we've been asked uh, by the United States government uh, through Defense and Space to reach out internationally, and this is an example of this. I also I liked how you said half a trillion. I think it might be a little bit less than that. I'll I'll uh, uh, ask uh, Dr. Faisal Shah Khan. Uh, to, to qualify, but perhaps Yarjan, that was prophetic. And that is what is to come because they will listen to this presentation of yours. <laughs> uh, Faisal. All right, thanks Dave and Yarjan, thank you. Uh, to, to, be, to, to address the, um, the recent investment by the US government, uh, I think this, this bill was just passed um, a month ago. Uh, the actual figure is two hundred billion dollars, so more towards you know a quarter trillion quarter than half trillion. a trillion. Yeah. Um, but nonetheless, substantial amount, of course, right? Uh, given the fact that, uh, uh, in my opinion, and in fact, what I, I I would argue anybody's objective opinion should be that the U.S., given its past leadership in in science and technology, right, uh, has been lagging dramatically when it comes to quantum technologies. Um, and uh, this is not like a you know, condemnation, it's just, <laughs> it's just a, a fact, you know, it's the fact. That, but the point is that, you know, uh, uh, the, the message seems to have come across, right, uh, gone across. And now we have this big, uh, you know, substantial amount of money that's been allocated to quantum technologies. And in fact, I'll, I'll point out something that um, is unique about this bill, and it connects to what Yarajan said. Uh, this bill actually specifically mentions AI and quantum technology, right? So if there's a, a notion out there for some instant, for some reason that AI, quantum technology is, is competing with AI, uh, that's just simply not true, right? It's the fact that they are complementing each other. Uh, certainly it's the case that, you know, quantum technologies can mean, can contribute a lot to the development of AI, uh, their implementation in an effective way, you know, AI algorithms. But I think what's not uh, typically discussed is that AI can contribute a lot to the development of quantum technologies, right? Uh, quantum algorithms are hard to implement. They're hard to put together. Uh, quantum hardware is even more difficult. So are there machine learning techniques, right? For example, that, that can help in that case. Um, so in fact, Dave, uh, your alma mater, uh, Waterloo, Right, yeah. has a pretty substantial, you know, big group of people working in that specific direction, yeah. uh, as evident by uh, a conference I attended a couple of years ago there, which was specifically yeah. for, uh, I think the title was AI for Quantum. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's something I should, I wanted to mention. Yeah. Um, and uh, I guess really quickly, I mean, Yarchan, that's that's an amazing, uh, you know, uh, uh, article you put together. I, I was reading through it. Uh, it's pointing out all the right things to the policymakers in, in Pakistan and, of course, certainly the, the scientific community. And the fact that you mentioned 
that there should be some kind of regional cooperation between countries, right? Um, and this is something I, I had in mind when I put together the Middle East and South Asia quantum computing meetup group. You know, the fact remains that, you know, we have a substantial input coming from India. Uh, you know, India already has invested, earmarked a uh, billion dollars towards quantum technology, uh, specifically, I think it was announced last year. Uh, and I'm not aware of uh, any groups working in Bangladesh. So I was really happy to hear that, that that's happening. And I think uh, this is all, you know, South Asian countries and they should perhaps look into that. Uh, I think SARC uh, used to be an organization. I don't know if it's still uh, active. Uh, it's the uh, Association for South Asian Countries for Cooperation, right? That might be a, 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 um, a policy making, you know, body, governing body that could be maybe targeted or, or, you know, in terms of getting the information forward and saying, hey, this is something to pick up on. Uh, let me end by saying the following. Um, go, growing up in the 90s, uh, I noticed that Pakistan missed out the IT train, in my opinion, right? <laughs> That's my opinion. Uh, it could have done so much more. But, uh, you know, here's an opportunity for Pakistan to, you know, enter the game, right, when there are no rules. <laughs> And set the rules, right? These are the this is these are the days to, to set up the rules. And of course, it doesn't have to be Pakistan by itself. You know, as I said, that this is a cooperative thing, and we should build up on what's available, uh, you know, globally and in the region. So, uh, Dave, with that, uh, I give you back the mic. Oh, uh, thank you very much, Basil. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna give it back to you just for a moment. Uh, in that, uh, I understand that you were involved. Uh, with uh, CPEC. And, and first of all, the uh, CPEC, what does that stand for? Right. Uh, CEPC stands for the China uh, Econo China Pakistan Economic Corridor. I think uh -huh. I got it right. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> CPEC. That's right. Yeah. Yes. And, and, and uh, yeah. You, you and asked if I was. $62 billion uh, project that you were in, involved in uh, to, to some extent. That's correct. The, the, it is, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's allocation of funding is $62 billion. Uh, I think most of them, Shaba and uh, Yarjan, please correct me if I am wrong here. I think uh, primary funding comes from China. There's some contribution from within Pakistan. And uh, I'll, I'll give a lot more detailed account uh, near the end of today when I, when I give my presentation. It's a short presentation, nothing too, too fancy. Um, but uh, with respect to my involvement, I, I did work on a project with a, a team of Pakistani scientists uh, at the National University of Science Budget in Islamabad uh, last year. And uh, the professor there uh, I was working with was uh, Aisha Khalik, and she had some undergraduate students, really good ones. Um, they used a quantum annealer. Um, well, the only one that's available in the market right now is from D-Wave. So they use D-Wave's quantum annealer uh, to study the uh, optimization of traffic signal, um, you know, um, management uh, on a network of roads. And the road networks that they had in mind was, of course, the road, you know, infrastructure of roads that's part of the CPEC project. And the idea was that could we you know, optimize traffic flow once that infrastructure is in place using quantum technology. Uh, so this is why I think there's a big role, even for the one point generation 1.0, the first generation of, you know, um, quantum technologies that offer a quantum of advantage, as you were saying earlier, rather than the full quantum advantage. Nonetheless, you know, there's an advantage that can be had for, for projects that are this big. Yes, uh, thank you, thank you, Fassel. So we've been we've been uh, asked by the U.S. government uh, to uh, look for the large projects where a quantum of advantage can be found, and so we're connecting the dots on the largest projects in the world, and we are creating connections. And I had mentioned cricket uh, in my uh, uh, earlier uh, hello. And just as uh, cricket brings together people, we're also looking to bring together India and Pakistan uh, for the CPEC project through universities. And again, uh, Yarjan and, and Shabazz, who we'll hear from in a moment, uh, the esteem that you bring from the University of Cambridge 
and the level of quantum technology that you're working with, material science related, is really something. And I hope we'll have some time to get into the technical details about that as we at quantum, uh, at the quantum lab, uh, at the quantum garage at Dark Star are looking to bring together and to be able to create a, a product line based on advanced technology. This is a roadmap. This is a multi-year roadmap based on the science from the best scientists out there. And having Cambridge here is great. Yarjan, I like how I said the best scientists out there and you kind of raised your hand. It's like, it's the timing. I think you're, I think you're stretching. I think you're stretching, but yeah, I'm gonna... trying to stretch. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I think he raised his hand. He knows his worth. <laughs> Well, I, I, I like that. So we, we have, uh, so at, at this stage in the conversation, we're talking about policy. We've been asked also to, to identify policy, those who are writing for policy, uh, which Yarjan, uh, you, have, you have done with that article. And we'll be bringing that to the attention of the US government uh, for these large scale projects with a quantum of, of advantage. And we're also looking for the particular work that you've done as a quantum scientist uh, where that can be connected. That may or may not happen on this conversation, but there will be a follow-up for that. Now, the uh, Fasil, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to, to engage uh, Shabazz, uh, as we were doing yesterday, uh, to talk about policy. Uh, Shabazz, your thoughts uh, as a Cambridge PhD in this, in this area, uh, uh, possibly talk about the article that, that Yarjan has, has written and we'll do that for five, 10 minutes. And uh, then uh, we will engage uh, into the next component uh, of, of this meetup. So uh, Fasil, I will give you the, the microphone uh, to please uh, introduce your, your, your friend uh, Shabazz and to have a conversation on, on policy and Shabazz, some of the things that we were chatting about yesterday. Uh, Fasil, please. Thank you, Dave. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, uh, I would like to also engage uh, Shahbaz in some of the scientific work uh, that's coming out of his lab and, you know, from, from him. Um, of course, I'll appeal to Shahbaz to keep it like, you know, <laughs> uh, no, casual, casual, sorry, uh, just to make sure that all the, you know, uh, non-technical audience um, uh, doesn't get, you know, lost in the technical details. Uh, so, uh, Shabazz, yes, let, let's uh, maybe start with, um, uh, you know, as, as Dave said, the policy side of things, uh, you know, what, what Yarjan talked about, you know, his vision, how do you see, how do you see that um, kind of coming to fruition perhaps in Pakistan? And what might be the challenges? So, uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, uh, Faisal, for the uh, uh, introduction and giving the opportunity to talk about this, I guess about uh, uh, policies, uh, maybe uh, Yarjan is the best person to talk, uh, but based on my work and based on my collaborations in Pakistani scientific community, uh, I can uh, at least see mainly that what are, you could say the main, uh, the challenges there and main problems are there, those uh, must be addressed. Uh, and because we are mainly talking about quantum technology, I guess first thing is that we should actually understand, so what quantum technology is, by the way, and what we need to do this. We know that why we need to do, because it is actually have a huge advantage compared to the classical things and we are in the quantum world. So there are many uh, scientific uh, kind of movies, people actually watch uh, many uh, complicated and strange uh, quantum mechanical uh, phenomena uh, the directors try to try to film there so uh, on uh, the very simple and a straightforward thing is actually i must say that the for the future of uh, quantum technology all over the world the mother is a material science uh, uh, science because the materials are playing the most important role in, uh, in this actually the, we can say the side of the science and for the development of course. And uh, so in, in, in Pakistan, uh, this is also uh, one of the major issues that uh, the, the startup of uh, the right direction or uh, startup towards actually, we could say the, uh, for example, toward the material sciences and for the material sciences, you need a huge and a large, uh, you could say the infrastructure. So for that, 
uh, it is uh, not possible even for example in cambridge we cannot do all the things that we really want to do related to our research we have to go to the other labs we have to go to the high tech labs so in that case we always develop uh, uh, the collaborations and we always act to extend our uh, uh, you can say the network but here there is a one very uh, good uh, and a positive thing that's happening in the united kingdom uh, is we call it a national facility that for example i uh, uh, for example uh, write a project to get uh, uh, get funding for, uh, for for getting some instruments or uh, you can say the apparatus and that apparatus if it is coming from a national funding then that apparatus will also be a national it will not be only of cambridge university anyone all over the uk if he would be uh, he would like to use that he can actually approach us and we can actually we must facilitate him or her to use that so 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 in this way what will be the result that actually the nation spends the money on one instrument in the one at the one place what all over the nation in fact taken the advantage so this is actually you can say one of the examples uh, to to build uh, you can say a national uh, uh, you can say the as uh, jarjan also actually mentioned in his uh, articles that that national national policy and national you could say the uh, project on the nation base uh, you can say the on on that level uh it is really required and needed to develop uh you can say the uh, you can say the uh institute institutes not institutes because i i i i i don't know that how to actually convey this message but very simple straight thing is that if uh, we can actually link up the institutes to make it a, like a national institute a national uh, Uh, based on the national policies yeah so this is actually the the main thing uh, uh, that we must look forward so um uh, shabaz uh, as we get into the technical uh, thing side of things uh, you know uh, maybe we should uh, mention what we mean by quantum technology specifically i mean of course yeah. there can be a lot of things but just just for the record uh, you know i think we are talking about quantum computing primarily yeah is is that uh, would that be accurate yeah uh, yes and and when at least say we we say the quantum technology our main uh, you could say the uh, the major application we always say the quantum computing so uh, for not only the quantum computing as you also actually uh, mentioned about quantum annealing and quantum annealing is uh, really a very interesting thing interesting thing in a way that for example uh, uh, because you know of course much better than me about quantum annealing that that now our uh, cities are going to be uh, quite much congested and the huge metropolitan cities we do have uh, almost many in every country and then our air traffic is extending and that air traffic is not only the uh, you can say the uh, aviation so what uh, uh, now the age is moving toward the private uh, uh, you can say uh, jets and also even flying cars Uh, and on the other hand uh, uh, the business uh, transportation everything is getting complicated and this quantum computing can actually sorry this quantum annealing the quantum annealing is the requirement if we want to extend on those directions then quantum annealing is actually the requirement and then if we move toward the quantum computing why actually the computing is is needed quantum computing is that now Uh, even actually since last two years we actually saw that uh, now almost the people those were actually little away a, a, a little little away from uh, this technology uh, now they also have to come in uh, somehow uh, related with uh, uh, this uh, computing technology so we we actually need even more bigger uh, you can say the uh, 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 computations uh more uh, you can say the complicated science that we do have that we need to solve and we also actually need to process a huge and a bigger data that we actually ever saw in last two years we even had 
uh, too much data that we had to put on the data centers. So this, if we look on these all, uh, you can say the, uh, the major developments, those are happening all over the world. It is telling us that where we should move or what we should do, the quantum computing is uh, actually uh, required quantum annealing at these old quantum, actually the information technology, quantum com uh, 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 communication. We actually uh, need to develop uh, the materials or the systems those uh, actually can help us. For example, now I actually just uh, uh, want to connect it with the, our work that we uh, actually doing since last uh, 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 about uh, 13, 14 years. Uh, so, so, so what we actually uh, are doing, so our try is twofold. Number one is that if we can utilize quantum materials in such a way that we can do the spintronics without dissipation. Because if, for example, we, we actually start to, to, to develop a huge data centers and big uh, computing machines, then we must also keep in mind that we are not only advancing in technology, but we are spoiling our environment. That could be uh, quite much dangerous for us. So then we should do this in actually, you can say, uh, uh, eco-friendly. So in such a way that it could not damage the environment. And secondly, that if we can actually do these old things with some, you could say, uh, uh, the higher temperature uh, uh, right now, uh, the most of uh, the quantum technology that we are using for uh, uh, this uh, quantum computing and related things are actually at a very low temperature. So for example, you mentioned the D-Wave. So D-Wave's quantum computer is working uh, uh, below one Kelvin. So it is actually not only one Kelvin, so it's about uh, point, uh, uh, point 0.1 Kelvin in principle, I guess, if I'm not wrong. So, so now you see that to, to keep these things running, we also need uh, even, uh, you could say, the uh, bigger budgets just to keep them running. And in the same way, for the data centers to keep them running, just to keep them, uh, them running, we need about 4% of all of the world power, 4%. And these are actually the numbers just before uh, uh, this uh, prona lockdown. Uh, since the corona, uh, this coronavirus uh, C19 lockdown, uh, the requirement of data centers has actually increased. So it means you need actually more power to keep them running and sorry, uh, let me correct myself here that I mentioned 4%. This 4% is just for cooling, not running the machine, just for cooling actually. Okay. Now that is why, for example, in the United States, uh, 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 a, it's a very famous uh, company related to the quantum computing to developing these, uh, these things. Uh, uh, this, uh, I sorry, forget uh, its name. Uh, this, uh, oh, uh, sorry, Hoffman. Hoffman, I guess. There's uh, uh, Ion Q, there's Gru Honeywell. Grumman, Grumman. Oh, Grumman. Okay. Grumman. Uh, so they actually recently uh, started a project and uh, they also actually asked for international collaboration that if uh, someone can collaborate with them to, to develop, uh, 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 you could say, the more efficient uh, data centers and more, you could say, uh, carbon emission free uh, computation, uh, that, uh, uh, this uh, data processing. So to develop a cryogenic uh, superconductor, uh, sorry, uh, cryogenic uh, uh, computer. So when I say cryogenic, super, uh, sorry, this uh, supercomputer, that means uh, that in that computer, what we want to do, we want to do all computations that be a supercomputer with the, the superconductors. So the technology that we will be, we will be using there, uh, it will not be a simple spintronics. It will be a spintronics, but using the superconductors. There, we would not be dissipating any energy. So the 4% of all over the world, uh, uh, the power which is just actually being used to keep that system cool uh, will be saved. But now you can ask the question that be careful when you are actually doing these numbers, 
that to keep a superconductor based computer running, you need actually cryogenics. So that's why now uh, we are actually looking forward again materials. You see, we have to go back to the material sciences. The materials, those can actually be a superconductor at uh, significantly higher temperatures. So, so, so these things actually uh, that what uh, we are looking forward in this uh, quantum, uh, quantum technology to develop and China, Japan, United States, United Kingdom, all over the world mean actually the bigger universities, they are extending their uh, departments on uh, uh, material sciences. Yes. Because yes. every yes. time you have to return back to the material sciences. Yes, yes. So, Shabazz, uh, I, I want to capture this moment. I've been making notes here. Part of what we're doing here, and I'm so excited that this has happened, I've clued into the relevance of your work uh, uh, to the environment and identifying uh, what needs to be funded. And this can be an international project uh, originating in the United States. Uh, this is part of the responsibility I've been, I've been given, and we can make this happen uh, on this meetup. So to, to uh, condense this, and I think, I think one of you guys are, are uh, uh, condensed matter scientists. I think one of you guys are condensed matter scientists. Yeah. Yes, yes, so to yeah. condense uh, what you just said, uh, Spintronics, uh, which yeah. we should talk about because that sounds so cool, uh, is about material science yeah. where we can raise the temperature from super cold yeah. as we move towards room temperature which will be a more efficient way of increasing computational power, yeah. both for traditional supercomputers, <laughs> as well as moving us towards room temperature quantum computing, uh, like we find in nature. Yes, so, so this is actually a very uh, interesting point. Uh, so as I already mentioned about superconductivity and these things, so there are two things now. Number mm -hmm. one, spintronics. Okay. Yes. So in spintronics, what we are doing in, in, in the normal uh, electronics that everyone actually using at this point, mm -hmm. we are ex uh, utilizing the one of the main properties of electron, the charge, charge of an electron. Mm -hmm. But char electron also have spin. If we can utilize its spin property, then we can actually do the spintronics. Okay, the charge will not be there, only the spin. You see, the heat dissipation energy loss is that when we are moving the charges, they are losing the energy during their transport. So what we can say, okay, you stay there where you are, only give actually, or you can say uh, transmit, or you can say uh, communicate with only the spin, okay? So you can say that, okay, now our current is not the charges, they are actually like a spin, okay? To do this, to, to, to actually utilize this property in spintronics, in spintronics gate, or in these devices or operational systems, what we want actually, we want to create uh, this spin current or spin polarized currents on a huge, uh, with, a, with a very huge quantity. Uh, quantity means that its density should be significantly large that it can operate our uh, these uh, qubits and bits. So for that, we need a very large current densities, which is uh, uh, not actually possible right now. So, because uh, it's more actually the, uh, uh, you can say it's not energy efficient, of course. Mm -hmm. It's even on the other way around. And then- well, if Shabazz, uh, the, we can solve one problem at a time. Uh, yes. You have, my understanding is you have breakthrough research, which is bringing us to a certain point. And uh, as you just identified uh, that there is uh, something else that's needed, this is where through a collaboration, uh, we're able to resolve it. Just before you continue though, Shabazz, uh, I wanna ask uh, Dr. Faisal Shah Khan uh, in that you have opened up identifying quantum annealing to quantum computing. This is a hierarchy. This is, a, this is a, almost a ladder, right? As we move up towards increased quantum uh, computational power. 
Now, uh, Fassel is also the chief product officer of Darkstar. And I'm gonna ask uh, Fassel what his thoughts are to add what you just identified uh, to this ladder, to this hierarchy, so that we can come back with a report to the, to the US government saying, here's a way to do this. And then if uh, when Fassel comes up with, with what you just said, agreeing uh, to that, uh, not to put words in your in your mouth, Fassel, but this is our, our goal, which you would qualify. And Fassel has the ability uh, uh, to overcome barriers. And this Shabazz is where you get inserted as, as the spintronics person as a material science. So in this way, we're creating a, a bridge from today to tomorrow for the expectations of the United States government, uh, similar to the moon landing, a statement was made, and then we found a way to do that. And in this case, Shabazz, uh, you are part of the rocket fuel. So with that said, uh, Fassel, may I have your thoughts on positioning what Shabazz said with respect to a hierarchy of moving up computational power, engaging quantum technology, which also includes quantum material science? Right. Well, uh, when, whenever people say, you know, sprintronics, uh, I start thinking of, you know, cricket. <laughs> so how do I put a spin on my, you know, cricket ball? Like, how do I throw a googly? Right. <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, joking aside, um, uh, the way I'm understanding uh, the conversation we just uh, had with, with Shabazz, and of course, I think we talked about this yesterday as well in our prep uh, with Shabazz. Um, <clears throat> The, the problem of, um, you know, um, heat dissipation or energy dissipation in computation goes, you know, goes back to, well, you know, back when, you know, electronics was being invented for computation, right? Uh, and I think there was a couple of papers that came out in the 1960s, uh, you know, from uh, some, some uh, really eminent scientists. Um, I think Charles Bennett was one of them. And uh, <clears throat> the idea was that, you know, in principle, you can do what's called reversible computing. Uh, meaning that uh, computations can be, you know, in a mathematical term, it's a pretty straightforward idea. You, you basically can implement a one-to-one -one function, right? Uh, that's easy to say in math, but, you know, when you say it, like, you know, from a technology point of view, clearly it's very hard because uh, we don't have reversible computing even today, right? Uh, all, all, I mean, we may have, you know, minimized the heat dissipation, but there's still uh, quite a bit of it. Certainly when Chabas said it comes to large data centers, right? Uh, there's a lot of that happening. So from that point of view, I mean, it's an amazing idea. Quantum computing has, you know, is, is, has been, and, you know, there's several ways to show this. It's, uh, you know, equivalent to reversible computing. Um, and, and in fact, it might have um, um, uh, more, more, more features to, 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 you know, to it, but nonetheless, uh, they're equivalent. And so from that point of view, the question becomes, you know, how do we, you know, the, the, the task of finding, heat free or, or energy efficient computing power uh, becomes the same as building a quantum computer, which becomes basically the same as finding new materials for that to happen, right? And um, it, with, with respect to, you know, where this can be useful commercially, I mean, I think I've said it, right? It's, uh, it's, it's, it's the holy grail. It's like, how do I make a computer that uh, dissipates zero energy, for example, right? Um, that's amazing. Um, and of course, if you have the material, sorry, Shabazz, just one, one last thought. If you have the materials for that, uh, I can only imagine applications of that materials to, to other things like, you know, uh, minimizing fuel cost for airplanes and then things like that, right? So with that, uh, Shabazz, please take it away. Yeah, sorry, I was actually interested to add a, a little here that, that what you said about the dissipation, the dissipationless uh, electronics, or you can say dissipationless spintronics, so this is, we do have materials in principle, so we just need to utilize them. Let me give you, give you one example that, for example, that we have given the example of uh, superconductivity. So superconductivity means the transport at uh, 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 zero, uh, with, the, with the zero resistance. So resistance zero means ideally that dissipation is zero. So now if we can utilize these superconductors in spintronics, then it means our spintronics will be dissipationless, where we need actually the huge crunch to perform spintronics logics. 
So if we will be doing with the such materials, those we do have already, we can actually do with the uh, without dissipation. But the main question, the major question in this field is that you can say to me that she was look in a superconductor. As I said that we are exploring spin in spintronic. In the superconductors, there uh, is a correlation between the electrons. One electrons stay with the spin up, other electrons stay with spin down. So totally zero. So they are not actually the good for spintronics. Then in actually the beginning of this uh, century, in 2001, uh, uh, this new idea actually came, okay, now you can actually also have supercurrent where a superconductor where all electrons have one direction of the spin. What in that case, you have to actually work with, the, uh, with, with ferromagnets, putting superconductor, ferromagnet, make the devices. And then uh, in 2006, there was one actually the observation from Delft University, but after, after that, there was a big break because at that time, uh, we were not able to understand why, why actually it is happening and how it is happening. And then in 2010, from Leiden University, Cambridge University and Michigan State University together, uh, at that time, I was actually at Leiden University. Uh, I was working on this problem. So we uh, almost at the same time, uh, we actually uh, published the papers uh, with the possible solutions. And uh, on the basis of those three uh, articles, we actually now are able to develop these devices where we can have that kind of uh, supercurrent. But now, where we are right now is to increase this in the temperature. because. This technology that we can establish can happen only at a very low temperature, close to the one Kelvin or the two Kelvin. But this is still actually economically, it is not really, you can say, uh, suitable at this point. You can actually try to do, uh, uh, you can say, the uh, develop uh, spintronic devices based on that, but then again, we need a cryogenics and, and, and the helium which is quite expensive gas and you need the, in, the, in the liquid form, more expensive. So if you will go up toward the high temperature superconductivity, use that in this technology, then you can actually go toward a, a, a higher temperature and more economical uh, yeah. things that what actually the scientific community working on this direction is looking forward. Yes. Sh Shabazz, uh, I uh, appreciate how you've introduced another theme uh, which is uh, how Dark Star works, uh, which is really looking at the best out there and then bringing those best practices in. Uh, so you identified connecting the dots, are my words, to other scientific papers. And you've identified decades of research and you put them together to get you to the point where you are. And in your mind, you know this can be done. And you've identified in a constraint so what we're going to do is we're going to put out a call to action to Harvard, to MIT, to University of Waterloo, who Basil, you and I were speaking to the Institute for, for Quantum Computing uh, yesterday. Uh, we will, we will, and we'll, we will um, introduce you, uh, Shabazz and, and Yarjan, as a way of bringing together the world's greatest work. So theoretically, we can figure out amongst the world scientists how it can be done. And what we're proposing at our 122,000 square foot quantum garage in North Carolina, where FASL uh, is moving to, we won't be living in the quantum garage, but uh, as uh, you're beginning your work at, at Paraspace Schema Business School, located at the NC State, North Carolina State, we'll be looking at this as a hub to bring together quantum technology, to bring together traditional technology like AI, to bring together the greatest scientific works out there to connect the dots and to overcome this. And then Shabazz, we would look to you to, to elevate it to the next steps as in your mind, you have ideas of how to do that. And we will look for this work to follow the path that Yarjan has laid out uh, in his article, which connects back to the $62 billion China, Pakistan, 
economic corridor project. And one of the themes as well that we spoke about has to do with the scheduling. Uh, you mentioned Shabazz, the scheduling uh, of traffic on, on the ground. You also mentioned the scheduling of the air and you mentioned even flying cars. These are the things we've been asked to look at by the US Air Force. They're looking to us for this. We have uh, Captain Cole, uh, a 777-787 Dreamliner pilot of decades who is on our, our, our group. He's an advisor for us and we'll be bringing your request to him and he will slot it in so that we can actually solve this from the air to the ground. And in fact, we've been asked to solve this for space for low orbit, which was the last meetup that we, that we held or the May 22nd meetup we held uh, with the defense and space community uh, through Colonel Joe Booker. So these great words that you're speaking of are familiar to us. And we're excited how we are connecting the dots uh, in this way. And uh, Fasil, I'll turn it back to you uh, as you are creating the, the ladder uh, as we move up towards greater computational power, zigzagging back and forth. I should also mention, as I forgot to, that Fasil is recognized by D-Wave as a developer for scheduling and uh, has experience. In fact, we have started coding in order to schedule, for example, uh, airline pilots. Uh, so I, or, uh, the, the, uh, the air flight, the air traffic control. So Shabazz and, and Yarjan, I wanted you to be aware of that uh, in that what you're speaking about possibly theoretically is becoming practical uh, through Dark Star. And what I'm looking for you and at the end to summate this is to have a project, to identify a project. And we'll create a paper uh, for these great words uh, that you're speaking to us today. Uh, and we will then take action on this. Uh, so uh, Sh Shabazz, I, I hope that makes you feel good. Of course, yes. Yeah, because we are always looking at these kind of opportunities. <laughs> that, is, that is lovely, that's so, so lovely. I'm gonna ask something else here uh, of you. Uh, Fasil uh, mentioned when we mentioned spin, spintronics, your words, you're an expert in that. Fasil mentioned cricket. And he talked about putting the spin on the ball and the googly. Uh, uh, Sh Shabazz, I think that cricket might be a good way to describe and appreciate your technology without going into the details. Uh, are, are you a fan of, of, of cricket, Shabazz? Yeah, I am from Pakistan, specifically. <laughs> Otherwise, they will cancel my passport. <laughs> <laughs> would so, you can i may i ask of you uh to describe uh, a, a standard pitch uh, uh made uh by a fast bowler in cricket mm -hmm. and then elevate it by way of what you were doing with spintronics so yeah interesting thing so in uh, in in the in the cricket you see that what we are doing, uh, I don't know how actually what could be the best way uh, to do that. So we are spinning the ball there and there, the same thing we are doing with the electrons that when these electrons will interact with the other, so we want to interact them, not with their charge, but with their spin to give mm -hmm. this spin information to the other. So, yes. So you see that in, in, in the cricket, the, the king is the person who can actually spin more. Yes. So uh, reverse or forward, whatever. Uh, so uh, who, who can be, that can be, you can say, more dangerous. And in the same way, in physics, it's a very old saying that the person or the nation will actually lead the world or govern the world that would know how to control the spins of the electrons. Yes, yes, yes. So, great. so this is, uh, yeah, that's why uh, for the spintronics, it is actually, spintronics is a very, very, you could say the uh, valuable or uh, you can say the uh, important 
uh, technology that people are looking forward are spending a lot of uh, money on that. And this technology is not actually on, we could say the uh, conventional ways, it is also connected with quantum technology. And this quantum technology can go into word quantum computing, for an example, this is still actually at a very uh, basic, uh, you can say the, uh, uh, on, on, you can say the, uh, the research is on a fundamental level. Yes. What that research is, we are talking about the spin, cricket and cricket ball spinning. So yes. if, for example, we put this thingy in our devices yes. and we do it with the superconductors as I uh, already described, and yes. now reduce the dimensions, of, yes. the, of those systems. Yes. If we will reduce the dimensions, we can have a phenomenon, because in, in quantum materials, what is the most surprising? That electron is in fact not working as a electron. So this right. may be a little bit stupid statement for a common person, but it is true that the electron as we are looking at it in the normal metals, it is not actually behaving in the same way in quantum materials. And those quantum materials can be yeah. utilized to develop quantum technology. And their electron can even behave as half electron. Meaning that there was a concept from one Italian uh, theoretician who actually disappeared uh, in around about 1926, no, 1946 maybe, I don't know exactly, I guess this was the time, I forget, yeah. uh, Majorana. So, so you see, uh, that was, this is the technology that you can actually, when you are having a nano, you are, you are adding nanotechnology with quantum technology using spintronics and superconductivity. So this milkshake of these all the things actually, it is giving you a more complicated and a beautiful concept where you can actually utilize these phenomena to do quantum computing without the errors. Errors means because you people are more actually familiar about the quantum technology that we are doing qubits and then we are having, um, you could say, uh, uh, this uh, quantum state. For example, you are going from one quantum state to the other. Yes, you yes. took a path to go from one state to the other. This information can depend on this path, can lose somewhere, yes, okay, yes. in the quantum. What yeah. if you are actually mixing up these all the things together and you are doing this with the, this new, you can say phenomena uh, yes. that we call them Majorana particles. In that case, the information that depend on your initial state, final state, it never look at the path that you took. So then it means that your quantum competition is based on your initial state and the final state. What happened in between, we don't care. Then what you lost, what you gain in the way, it is not our problem. So now means that quantum computing can be without pause. What the problem is that it is still actually at the fundamental level, this research. People observed these kind of particles, this kind of phenomena and we just need to confirm those discoveries and yeah. we need to develop the breeding technology that how we can breed with those actually the yes. states yes. to yes. develop uh, uh, quantum computation. Yes, yes. Yeah. Shabazz, that is so exciting. Uh, you've identified error-free quantum you. computing, uh, which, is, which is something that's not available right now. And, and no. Professor will talk no. about that. But Shabazz, uh, you have put together nanotech uh, with your spintronics. Uh, so we're connecting the dots here. And uh, I, uh, I want to come back to uh, the analogy. Thank you for answering my question, which is just, just in terms of as a fast bowler to mm -hmm. throw the ball, spinner who spins it is king. If you are king of the spin, you are king of the game. Right? So Shabazz, you are our king. You oh, become, you must you become, I'm not. <laughs> well, no, no, it's like in terms of spintronics by, by this work, which you identify as theoretical, which we can bring into the laboratories, which is what quantum, uh, what Dark Star is all about. 
we have a we have a roadmap uh, in order for this to come about because the benefits uh, appear to me uh, to to be extraordinary. Now, for this, I'm going to ask Fassel to comment uh, on on that. Your your thoughts, Fassel. Absolutely. So uh, what Shabazz just described, you know, with respect to error-free uh, quantum computi computing, uh, uh, that's a great idea. It's been around for some time, but uh, even today, uh, you know, it's it's uh, it's difficult to 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 even realize. Uh, to, I guess the way I'm trying to say is that, uh, and Shabazz, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, the particles needed for the the actual braiding and all that stuff. Uh, have not been observed yet. They're, they're basically a theoretical construct. Uh, there are actually some observations, some are controversial, and uh, some people actually say, okay, they are, but uh, very, with a very recent development, one paper has uh, retracted from uh, nature. So maybe we are again at the fundamental level. <laughs> Now, not to say that the, the, the subject is not interesting, it's just that it's, uh, as Shabazz said, it's at a very fundamental level today. Uh, so, you know, it's one of those things where we obviously want to keep on working, but uh, coming back to my philosophy of quantum of advantage rather than quantum advantage, uh, this would be kind of, you know, uh, tangential in my opinion. Uh, nonetheless, of course, you know, the, 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 the Technology is promising if, if, you know, if we can get the physics in place, absolutely. Okay, so, so thank you for qualifying that, uh, Fassel. We, 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 we have uh, the, you, your statement, the benefits uh, would be worth it, but yes. where are we and how do we move forward? We don't know that, and we don't need to know that right now, uh, yeah. but we have a place to start because we're, again, exactly. we're, Dark Star is, is looking around the world for the best technology to understand where we can move and what to fund. Uh, and uh, this is where the $200 million and a, a national institute uh, is, is something that we're, we're a part of. And we're advising uh, as to where that funding should go and what should happen. Uh, so I see a, although from a practical point of view, like tomorrow, uh, that's not gonna happen. I'm not worried about that. We're, we're, setting, we're setting the future. We are saying this is what we're moving uh, towards. And uh, as a time check, it's, it's five after one. I think we're going to 1.30. I want to just uh, share with you uh, to give you, to inspire you. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm holding in my, in my hand uh, a, a PCB. It's a flexible PCB. It's a printed circuit board. It looks like it could be a tattoo, but it's a printed circuit board. It says, it says dark star, uh, dark leaf on it. This is something we printed through Canadian technology. I'm, I'm in Canada. Uh, and uh, I want you to see that Dark Star is pulling together what others have said is impossible. And here I'm holding it uh, in our hands. I can, I can send you copies uh, later on. The, uh, and this is something that uh, Fassel put together. Uh, as our chief product officer, Fassel takes the science and then he turns to me as a project manager and says, Dave, make this happen. It can happen. This is what we require. Go source around the world, find those scientists, find those outliers of technology that can be brought to bear. And in my hands, ladies and gentlemen, I'm holding an example uh, of that. Now, uh, again, coming back to, to, uh, to Jardin, uh, where you have uh, created a link uh, in terms of policy, which I think should feed into the institution that, that Shabazz has mentioned. And for Fassel, uh, we have talked a little bit about the $62 billion China-Pakistan economic corridor. It may be a good time, uh, Fassel, for you to share your presentation on that. Put this into perspective uh, as hope uh, uh, and as, as a way of creating into reality uh, what Shabazz uh, has uh, shared with us uh, so that we can use spin uh, and become uh, king uh, uh, in ways that we had not thought to be possible right now. Thank you, Shabazz, for opening our eyes. Uh, Fassel, I, I give you the, the microphone. Are you able to share your screen? Um, I will ask Vera to please allow me to share my screen. 
and I, then I'll uh, give a yeah, short. I wanted to, gentlemen, I wanted to draw your attention to something else as well. Uh, you know, since we are talking about uh, superconductors, which I think is the holy grail for participationless computing and quantum computing. So I believe that, you know, we have a breakthrough uh, recently uh, uh, which, which was happened in, at MIT by Professor uh, Pablo Jarilo Herrero. And uh, he is the one who discovered superconductivity in graphene. And graphene is a technology which can be printed uh, since you were, you were holding this flexible piece in your hand. So graphene is, is, you know, like used very heavily in flexible electronics. And that's what we do basically at Cambridge Graphene Center and the University of Cambridge. So we print graphene with different techniques on, on you know, a different, uh, a lot of uh, these kind of flexible uh, substrates. So, so that is something uh, which, which is going to play uh, a big role, uh, hopefully in future of uh, quantum computing as well. Yes, yes, I agree with that. And what I didn't qualify, thank you for that, uh, Arjan. Uh, and we're bringing together the uh, technologies where different universities have different areas of expertise. It's getting to the actual scientists, which we're able to do uh, because uh, through the PhD network. And this is actually a hybrid classical quantum circuit uh, where we take our micro quantum technology, QRNG, quantum random number generation, mm -hmm. uh, and the chips are, are sized for this. Uh, this would be part of uh, uh, Fassel's presentation if he oh, wants yeah. to speak to it, but thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Yarjan. Uh, uh, Fassel, maybe you can build that in. Uh, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I'll start sharing my screen, but I want to uh, come point out that Bilal has posted a couple of questions. Uh, Bilal, we'll address those right after I'm done. Uh, because they're important questions, I think. So here's my um, screen. Um, please tell me if you can see it, Dave. Yes, I can see it. All right, let me start here then, at the beginning. Uh, so yes, uh, let me just uh, go through a you know short number of slides. It's just I think ten or so. I'll do it quickly. Uh, I just wanted to talk about the the you know the idea here of uh, using. Uh, what is available out there today in terms of uh, quantum technologies? You know, it's a very first generation, you could call it um, very noisy. In fact, that's the term people use, noisy uh, intermediate scale quantum technologies. Uh, certainly in the context of quantum computing, if, if not in the other sense, but let's just get into that. Uh, so the focus would be, you know, on multinational projects. These are the big ones, like for example, you know, there's a $62 billion CPEC project. Uh, they were, uh, rumors, or if, if maybe they've become news now, that there was a $400 billion project China was uh, trying to work on with India and Iran. Uh, so those are the kind of projects that, you know, I think um, I would like to focus on, right? These multinational, you know, uh, big projects where people, people come together and utilize new technologies for, for creating value and economic prosperity. So, um, Here's uh, you know, a picture that I picked up. Uh, it's a picture of uh, Gawadar port, which is part of the CPEC project. It's the tail end, if you will, of, of you know, where the project ends uh, with respect to Pakistan. I'll uh, have another few things to say about it later. But the reason I put this picture up here is because of the containers that we see here, uh, the, the cargo containers and you know, how this, these will play a role in you know, how quantum technology can be used here for a project like this. Um, so here's a little map uh, that motivates why, you know, CPEC was actually initiated. It's part of a much bigger project. Uh, people who know about this uh, probably know more about it than I do. But uh, the fact is that China has some, you know, grand uh, visions on, on economic prosperity and development. And um, <clears throat> as evident by this map here, for example, if you look at the right part of the screen uh, where Beijing is, uh, if you think about uh, a port here, Tianjin port, you know, cargo starts here, then it has to follow this pretty long, sorry, forgive me for a second. Uh, uh, there we go. Uh, this, this line, which goes from, uh, you know, all the way out here down to Hong Kong, then, you know, goes around uh, Southeast Asia, around India, all the way to 
the Hormuz state and then into you know Middle East, basically ports in the Middle East. Sorry, uh, that was too quick. Uh, and uh, that's actually a very long path for for cargo to follow with respect to China. You know, what, when they're sending uh, cargo across, um, the plan instead is to have a road. Uh, infrastructure, roads infrastructure, starting in Kashgar in China on the eastern side, sorry, western side of China, and going through Pakistan along this red line and ending up in Gawada port from which then you can actually send cargo by sea. Uh, that's a huge shortening of the um, of the of the route, right? The the sea route takes 13,000 kilometers. The land route will be 2,000 kilometers just going through through Pakistan. Of course, the question becomes, how long is this piece here? Well, I don't know about anybody else, but uh, even on a globe, a small arc is shorter than a longer arc, right? <laughs> so this piece will be pretty short compared to whatever you're seeing here. So overall, there should be a quite a bit of you know savings for China uh, with respect to um, supply chain management, and that's kind of the primary goal for this. Um, with you know access to markets in uh, Africa and beyond. And in fact, the next picture I have here kind of gives you the bigger picture beyond just CPEC. The, the CPEC is just one part of this uh, project that China has. Uh, it's a global infrastructure network, uh, you know, covering all of China landmass, the Chinese landmass, uh, all of Central Asia, and all the way through Europe. And of course, there's an angle to accessing the you know rich GCC countries as a, as a market. Uh, all the way to North Africa and, of course, Eastern Africa, uh, sorry, uh, Southern Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa. So it's a grand project, certainly much more than two, $62 billion. The $62 billion project is just, uh, you know, pertinent to Pakistan. So with that in mind, uh, let's take a look at what it means for Pakistan. Well, if you zoom in uh, on that piece of the, of the grand plan that China has, uh, which is what we're calling CPAC here, we see a, a network of roads that are envisioned here, and they crisscross all through Pakistan. These will include uh, ports like the Gawadar port that I mentioned earlier, and of course uh, there'll be uh, hubs right along the way, um, and there'll be national highways, motorways, and you know the hubs will be where, you know, of course there'll be market access, and uh, uh, you know uh, also they'll make part of the supply chain for cargo, which is uh, something I'll focus on in just a second, a little bit more. Um, here's a picture of Gawadar port again. It's a pretty big looking port, um, um, at least to me. Uh, there's a lot of cargo containers that can be put in here. Uh, and it's one of the deep sea ports. So, uh, you know, your, your container, your, your uh, cargo vessels can just, you know, uh, drive up, if I can say, or sail up to the car, you know, the, the port itself. Uh, so that's a substantial savings uh, in, in uh, money. So uh, this port uh, has cargo containers, as I said, and I want to get into that in just a second. Uh, the benefit here's a benefit matrix that I picked up from from uh, Prime Institute. It's an institute, I think, in Pakistan, uh, where they talk about China is expected to save approximately two billion dollars on supply of oil through the shortest CPEC route. Uh, you know, so all, there's a big substantial savings here for China from that point of view, as we talked about earlier. But for Pakistan, of course, the, the big benefit is of uh, developing infrastructure, uh, which uh, you know um, basically makes it a major player in the game of uh, supply chain. Now, how can quantum technology contribute here? So there are two technologies, of course, that uh, you know are commercially available today, and uh, these are quantum computing. So so you want to be able to speed up computing, uh, possibly optimizing the supply chain uh, management. Uh, with respect to say now CPEC here. Uh, and of course, provably secure intrusion detecting communication protocols also commercially available, a lot more mature than quantum computing. And of course, conveniently enough, China is leading in this technology. So this would of course, you know, come into play. I'll ask uh, Shahbaz and certainly Yarjan, uh, you know, given the close relationship China and Pakistan have, uh, you know, certainly with respect to CPEC, but in other areas as well, what that means for Pakistan. Uh, how would quantum computing help? Well, we talked about quantum annealing, and in fact, there's something called digital annealing that's also today available. Uh, they can process a flow of cargo, right? And so generally speaking, this is kind of what it looks like. You know, when you look at a quantum computing process or digital annealing process, you start off with a problem that's coming to you from the industry, and uh, it comes with certain constraints. You account for those, 
and you come up with an objective function in, in the form of what's called a quadratic unconstrained binary optimization problem, Kubo. Then you take the Kubo, convert it to an icing form, which allows you to take it closer to the actual hardware uh, that's running the quantum annealing process or the digital annealing process. And uh, then you're able to basically send it to the computer and, and let it execute to find a solution. And of course, the expectation is that the solution will be quicker, right? It'll be a better solution, more optimal solution than what's available out there today and, um, and so forth. So a Kubo, I just picked up an example of a Kubo from a paper that I wrote uh, three years ago. Uh, here's a simple example uh, from a project that had to do with financial portfolio optimization. Uh, we have come out, you know, these variables that we're trying to deal with, and there, there's a large number of them typically, which is why you need a quantum computer uh, or a quantum annealing processor. And you have these variables uh, related to each other through a notion of covariance, right? They, they vary with respect to each other's uh, behavior. And there's a certain notion of expected returns from what these variables do. And this last term here, uh, which has got a power two on it, it's a quadratic term, uh, that actually is where the constraints are. So typically when you're converting a problem from the real world into a quadratic, you know, Kubo problem, the constraints are where the major challenge is. You know, how do you incorporate them into the problem? And um, so, so that's kind of a challenging thing right there. Um, the issue, the other thing to keep in mind is that the variables are binary, you know, zero or one, right? One value or the other, not, not real value at the moment and so forth. Now, once you have a Kubo, you have to transform it into an icing. And that typically means you just do the algebra. So you expand the quadratic expression here and you keep in mind that the variables are binary. So, you know, one squared is, you know, uh, one and zero squared is uh, uh, zero and so forth. And uh, you basically end up with something that looks like this, where, you know, there's a little bit of messy things going on in the background. So there's a lot of, this is just math, right? <laughs> it's just algebra that you have to do. Uh, but it's not easy always, or at least I should say it's, it's, it's uh, complicated, can be complicated. And uh, so here's an example of where the HI term in the icing form is, of course, relating back to the Kubo form, but in a more slightly more complicated way. Uh, and as I said, it's just a matter of expanding the quadratic terms and, you know, trimming them out. So just to sort of give you an example of how this looks like. Now, I did some research a couple of days ago, and I finally found a paper, I found a quite, quite a bunch of them actually, that deal with uh, container routing problems, right? Cargo routing problems uh, in the sense of like, you know, how do you optimize that? You've got 10,000, well, maybe that's too big. You've got 200 containers coming on a ship, right? Uh, to the Gavadar port, but the Gavadar port is full. What do you do, right? You move, off, you obviously have to move, either tell the, you know, the, the cargo ship to go back, go to another port, or move these cargos that are in Gavadar port to some other facility. There's a whole bunch of allocating and scheduling, right? Dave had mentioned scheduling earlier. This is what this is all about. Cargo routing, scheduling, uh, it's all the same thing. So you have some sort of a similar, you know, uh, workflow constraints, give me the constraints, objective function, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if you, and as I said, I found some papers where I found the objective functions. People are doing research on this. It's just that they're not aware that they can do this research using quantum computers. And of course, they may not be experts in the area of how to transform the problem from, you know, what you see on the screen. What you see on the screen is a Kubo. It has to be transformed into an icing problem so it can be sent to the appropriate hardware. That's where Dark Star comes into play, right? This is where, where our expertise is. So you take a problem like this and, you know, it's perfectly amenable to, to being run on a quantum annealer or a digital annealer. And uh, again, my point that what is unlikely here is that you'll get a quantum advantage in the sense that all of a sudden everything's solved in two seconds, right? That's not going to happen today with 1.0 uh, uh, generation of quantum computers, but you will probably get a quantum of advantage, a slight advantage that will translate into savings, you know, some kind of money making because the monies involved is, are, um, the money amount is so large, right? So there'll be some kind of advantage. It will be substantial from a practical point of view. So very quickly, uh, I wanted to bring up uh, quantum enhanced security, which is the other kind of quantum technology that I was talking about that China is actually leading in. Uh, you can see this is a military oriented uh, picture. Uh, you know, we, we 
we were shown this from from you know a, 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 a person who's advising us in the US government. And uh, you can see that there's networking going on in here. You know, there's satellite networking, there's communication hubs down here, there's a war fighter, and uh, there's communication between them, wireless communication, right? Now, can we make all of this quantum enabled? Should we? Absolutely, first of all, we should, right? Because right now they're just insecure. Anybody can hack into them with a, you know, who, who su anybody who's suitably motivated can hack in and, and kind of create havoc. So you, there's a lot of effort, interest in this aspect of things. And as I said, China is leading. So for Pakistan, it would be nice, I think, in, in fact, imperative to consider that, you know, uh, collaboration with them. And perhaps they're already doing it, uh, but it'd be nice if they do it from a commercial point of view. Uh, with that picture in place, with that context, I want to introduce uh, Dark Star's joint all-domain quantum notion, JADQ. This is inspired by the U.S. Department of Defense Joint All-Domain Command and Control, what they call JADC2. You can read about it at this link. Um, basically, it's the previous picture that I you know, presented, but now we're looking at it from a commercial point of view, from a civilian point of view. And so the question becomes, how do we bring communication and scheduling, things you know, very pertinent to, to econ economics today, together in a joint quantum sort of networking framework, right? And um, to, to give you more details on that, um, let me just give an example. High frequency trading using quantum computers using AWS, Amazon Web Services. So today you can actually access these, you know, first generation quantum processors like uh, D-Wave's quantum annealer, Ion's Q quantum computer, um, you know, Honeywell's, et cetera. And you can send instructions to them and do problems. Um, so I wrote a paper recently with a colleague uh, and it has to do with uh, making a case basically for how we can use this available infrastructure of uh, you know, the first generation of quantum technologies for commercial activity like the ones you know, we're um, proposing for CPEC. Uh, we wanted to do it for high frequency trading, focus on that as a user case. So if you want to know more about it, of course, you can reach out to us, uh, you know, Dave, myself, uh, or you can read that uh, paper here uh, on the provided link. Uh, let me just end now with this last slide, uh, kind of giving a re really brief overview of what Darkstar is all about. Uh, this is right from our uh, updated, recently updated website. Uh, Darkstar aims to provide quantum computing solutions to all industries for superior real-time or near real-time data analysis with schedule, which is our one of our products uh, having to do with scheduling, uh, the, the you know issue I was talking about earlier with respect to cargo routing and container routing, using commercially available digital annealing and quantum annealing hardware. So we basically provide the expertise that allows uh, industry right, users who want to get into quantum computing today to, to actually be able to do so uh, without the pain, you know, that's involved in learning about quantum computing and how to actually use these machines. Uh, Darkstar aims to enable the transition from classical to quantum technologies. For this, we are thinking of uh, something called a quantum system on a chip, which we label as Darkleaf. Uh, Dave presented a little example, you know, earlier when he was holding it in his hand. Um, this has to do with our upgrading uh, um, of cybersecurity and sensing, uh, you know, solutions that we have in mind for U.S. government and, of course, in a civilian capacity as well, uh, enabling the value chain for circular quantum economy. Uh, you know, I want to use the word the quantum knowledge economy here because you know we want to create a knowledge economy with quantum in mind, so people can actually create value out of it. Um, we also are aiming to come up with a uh, one quadrillion circular economy milestone. This is this is what we're going towards. And we want to do this in the form of building coalitions in the quantum e ecosystem. And of course, beyond, right? We, we have to go beyond the small quantum ecosystem and involve more people you know, who are already, you know, uh, have added value to the industry and the economy and kind of, you know, connect these things to create even more value. Um, and with this, I will finish my presentation. Thank you very much. And Dave, back to you. Mm -hmm. Fessel, thank you for that. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, it was 
I mean, it's words uh, uh, that uh, the team overall uh, have been working on, and you brought it to new heights here. I'd, I'd like to uh, recognize uh, on our team, uh, Elena, uh, who spoke at the May 22nd Quantum Technology North Carolina Defense and Space presentation, uh, where that infographic uh, was, uh, uh, you, you shared it. Uh, we're seeing these things connect together. I'd also like to uh, recognize uh, who's on our, our meetup, uh, Alexander Jivov of uh, Quantum Amplify, uh, where you'll see mirrored words uh, regarding the quantum circuit economy, the circular quantum economy, uh, and uh, the trillion dollar milestone, as well as the one quadrillion dollar uh, circular quantum economy, quantum circular economy. Where that number comes from, ladies and gentlemen, uh, is if you do, if, if you're a specialist in finance and look at the money triangle, the money triangle at the very top is very little, that's where most of us live, but at the bottom is the stock market. Uh, this is the derivative market where the puts and the calls, the betting on the stock market. It is a virtual, uh, uh, almost superposition of money uh, that lands and becomes very real. And there are human experts that do this. I've worked with them for, for decades. Uh, they're called stockbrokers and they're elite. What we're looking to do or we're recognizing is that through AI, through the financial network, uh, through the $62 billion project, uh, which will provide a multi-fold, tenfold or higher fold return on investment technology because of IOT, because of industry 4.0, these things uh, will all naturally come together uh, through engineers, through the scientists. We're, we're coming together uh, on this. And uh, it is because of this, uh, this integration and because of uh, the cooperation of the scholars, uh, Yarjan, Shabazz and, and Fassel to come together to openly discuss, we are able to move us forward. Uh, this is known territory that we're moving into for those in the financial elite. Just speak with an officer uh, of a economic development office, ask them about the circular economy. This is within our reach. And through quantum technology, we're able to create a boost uh, of, this, of this tech. And so uh, I, uh, we do want to have a few minutes uh, for any questions. Uh, Fasil, you had mentioned some questions had, had shown up. Uh, I will turn it uh, uh, back to, to you uh, and as well uh, to uh, perhaps close off to thank your, your friends, uh, Shabazz and Yarjan. I will give my thanks at this point, but turn it back to you now, uh, Fasil, to address the, the questions in the, in the last few minutes and then to close things off. Uh, as the the originator, the creator uh, of of Mesa, back to you, Vessel. Thank you, Dave. Uh, appreciate that. Um, so the, there's a question from Bilal here. The two questions. So first, second one, I'll read first. It asks: uh, Is it possible to make quantum computer in Pakistan? Will China and USA help us to make QC? So I'll uh, maybe start with Yarjan. What do you think? Uh, you know, this is what I'm drawing the attention of uh, the Pakistani government and the authorities too, that, you know, we need to do things at home. We don't want to be the users of technology. Of course, there is no harm in building quantum technology use cases in Pakistan and apply it in wherever we want. But of course, you know, uh, looking at the bigger picture and for a long term, I want Pakistan to not only be a user, but also to you know, uh, instill this technology in our institutions, in our universities, link the universities with uh, with, with with foreign uh, leaders, foreign leading institutes, where there are people who are uh, taking this technology to to the next generation technologies of quantum computers. So I would like these networks to be formed, whether it's with China or with the U.S. or with the U.K. Uh, but, you know, it's the right time to form these networks, to uh, bring this technology forward in Pakistan and to, most of all, to intrigue the young generations uh, to, to, you know, come up 
with 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 ideas and implement uh, or or be a part of this quantum revolution. Wonderful, thank you, Arjan. Uh, Shabazz, your comments. So, <clears throat> I think very simple answer of this question could be yes, it is possible. Uh, but as actually Arjan already uh, mentioned this very beautifully. Uh, that you you actually can develop the collaborations not only with China US you can actually go to uh, to go any actually the suitable place where it is actually possible for you your actually own community is sitting outside and on the other hand why you are looking only China why not the, uh, India you can also actually uh, go to the India so of course you can. But uh, you need to uh, develop first uh, your uh, proper uh, orientation uh, toward this. That uh, if you want to do, you actually bring all the institutes at one stage and develop this uh, research toward this uh, technology. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. We can uh, do quantum uh, cricket with India. <laughs> yes, exactly. With the Q, not. See, <laughs> as you mentioned yesterday, also. That's right. That's right. No, absolutely. Uh, the, the regional push, in my personal opinion, is is uh, paramount. You know, we, we need to create new venues of cooperation. Uh, it, as I said, it's a new game. It's it's a game which is brand new. Even the rules aren't made mm -hmm. uh, right to a great extent. So so that's uh, what it means. Um, so and, and my two cents, Bilal, are that uh, yes, of course, people will help. Uh, China, knowing what I know, and I, of course I don't know everything, uh, my, my understanding of the relationship between China and Pakistan, uh, it, I think the, the onus is on Pakistan to, you know, ask China to, for help in at least, not in QC necessarily, but so much, but certainly in quantum communications. Uh, that, that's something that, you know, uh, they're, they're leading on. So, uh, and, and I think there may, as I said, there may be people already working in that direction. But uh, certainly, you know, anybody and everybody should get involved. You don't have to be a scientist or a PhD. You can be a citizen scientist uh, to get involved and get things going. So there's that. Uh, Bilal had one other question, which I'll really quickly answer for him. He was asking about which, uh, basically, which quantum computing platform he should be using. My recommendation would be IBM Qiskit. I used to be a Fairly big cricket, cricket, sorry, pardon me, <laughs> critic, cricket's on my mind, uh, critic of IBM Qiskit and IBM Q uh, a couple of years ago when they first started, uh, primarily because they weren't, you know, doing much at that time, but they have done really good in the you know, intervening two years. They have really remarkably improved the performance and, and just the whole package that comes with it in terms of, you know, what you can understand about quantum computing uh, in a layman's term. So Bilal, go with IBM Q. That would be my recommendation. And uh, Yarjan and Shahbaz, if you have recommendations, uh, please share them. Yeah, I would second you. Uh, yeah, this is a, a good option. And uh, on the other hand, uh, Google or the G, they are also actually doing the good job. Um, so if uh, available, then you must also actually can try. Wonderful. So uh, I don't see any other questions uh, at the moment on the screen. Uh, if people, if the attendees have questions, please, uh, you know, feel free to certainly contact me and Dave. Um, and I, I believe Yarjan and Shahbaz won't mind if they contacted you also. Uh, certainly try to link in with them uh, on LinkedIn, right? Uh, I think, and of course, all of us are open to that as well. Uh, so that would be great. Um, and uh, I hope to, uh, you know, continue this conversation. Uh, I think it's a great conversation with respect to Pakistan. Uh, you know, Pakistan is an emerging market, certainly, you know, economically from a CPEC point of view, but it can certainly be an emerging market from a quantum technologies point of view. And I hope to stay engaged with Shabazz and uh, Yarjan. Uh, Darkstar would hope to stay engaged with you guys. Uh, so with that, let me thank you both, uh, you know, very grateful for making the time on a Saturday, especially. Uh, to come and uh, you know share your thoughts and ideas with us, uh, you know inform us about things. Uh, Vera, thank you very much, our, our media director, who who also made time on Saturday. She just came back from a trip to Niagara Falls, I think. <laughs> thank you so much. 
And uh, of course, all the attendees, uh, thank you for coming. I should mention my mother and my sister. One of my sisters are actually in the audience. Uh, oh, thank you both for, <laughs> for attending. Uh, so give, yes, away, give uh, away, Basil. Give away. Oh, Family yes, there she is. She's, my sister's <laughs> clapping. <laughs> my, my mother's name is right next to my sister's. So uh, there they are. So nice. Basil, if, if I may, uh, to, to your sister, did you say that was your mother? My mother's here too, yes. So nice. So uh, dear sister and, and mother of, of Fassel, I have spent 30 years looking for him uh, to support the work that I started at the University of, uh, of Waterloo. And I'm so happy uh, uh, that uh, you have brought up Fassel and he's become the man uh, who he is. Uh, in the end, uh, we are a family, we are a community uh, who are working together for this to happen. Uh, and Fassel speaks uh, very nicely uh, about uh, his family. And I'm very appreciative uh, that you are, you are here. Uh, he is a man who will be uh, bringing Dark Star forth. And we're excited uh, for what that uh, brings with the company of Shabazz and Yarjan and Shabazz. I'm so looking for you to become the, the king of spin. Oh, um, where we have cricket with a, with a cue. Don't worry, Shabazz, <laughs> we'll, we'll get the fast bowlers in, in place. Uh, we will <laughs> have you well supported Thank for you. what Yarjan has put together uh, for his article. And we'll make this a diplomatic moment uh, with, with Fassel. Uh, and uh, with the U.S. government uh, supporting this project, who we will be reporting to afterwards. As we close things off, uh, Yarjan and Shabazz, if you could stay with us. Uh, we are into overtime now, but we'll close off the meeting. Uh, and uh, Fassel, of course, if you can join, and, and, and Vera. And we will now put together the statements that were, that were made. And uh, we will uh, then uh, share this on darkstarquantumlab.com, as well as our LinkedIn, where we will post a, a LinkedIn document uh, to tell you where this is going. Uh, and oh, thank you, Fakra. Uh, we are so proud of Fassel. He's the pride of our family. Dear Mr. Dave, appreciate your kind words. Uh, we, we at Darkstar and the family of meetups, which is York University Quantum Computing for Social Impact, uh, which is of course MESA, uh, which, which we're here today for, uh, as well as the Quantum Technology of North Carolina uh, meetup uh, with, our, with, uh, with David Wilkinson, uh, who has founded this. Uh, uh, we are a expanding family uh, of scientists through FASL and of enthusiasts. Uh, so it is because of Fassel's uh, leadership uh, that we're moving uh, into the 21st century technology so that things like Star Trek uh, can actually come about uh, we, where we have a brighter future. And so I will, I will close off with that. Uh, Fassel, uh, back to you. Thank you, Dave, so much, and thank you for your kind words, um, and thank you for bringing my mother and sister into the conversation. I'm, I'm sure they're uh, having a, you know, a good time. She, they had a good time. I'll talk to them later and find out if they enjoyed the conversation or not, but I'm sure they did, uh, and I'll update you. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, and uh, Vera, um, uh, please um, 